Good morning, everybody. Okay. Well, we, we heard a lot of thanks uh, for all the sponsors. I can't help it. I have to say thank you also for all the sponsors and thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure being here. Um, yeah, and that is a little that is a little bit strange, isn't it? <laughs> but I had to wear it. I love it. Thank you, Anya. And as I understand, there are uh, a limited number of these available, correct? Yes, so, okay. <laughs> so, um, as Julian mentioned, uh, this uh, topic, this lecture that I'm giving today um, is going to be a range of different stories meant to inspire, um, maybe scare you a little bit, I think possibly even shock you, uh, <laughs> but um, I hope you enjoy it. Let's see. First chapter, A Seahorse Tale. So a lot of scientific articles and uh, aquarium publications have discussed seahorses. They're really very strange creatures. I mean, the, the public looks at them and thinks, you know, is this an insect? What is this thing? <laughs> but it's a fish. It's a very improbable fish. And it's not just a strange looking thing. Uh, the more you study a seahorse, the more you realize that, that it has some very unusual characteristics. And seahorses belong to a genus uh, hip, Hippocampus. You know, they, they look a whole lot also like um, chameleons. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, I, I'm not much of a reptile person. I love all animals, but I, I am really, really fond of chameleons. They're quite beautiful, and they remind me of seahorses with the prehensile tail. They move slowly as they hunt their prey. They change color. Look at that, you know, there's a tremendous uh, similarity. I'm just from a scientific point of view, I've always been curious to see whether their brains are wired the same way because they have a similar hunting strategy. There's even pygmy chameleons as well as pygmy seahorses. Isn't that odd? And of course, everybody knows uh, the amusing characteristics that the male seahorse gets pregnant and gives birth. Uh, that makes everyone love the seahorse. Also, more recently, it's been discovered that the bony structure, which makes them look like an insect, it has a purpose. It's not just there to make us wonder about seahorses. It pr provides them uh, an armor that uh, makes them resistant to crushing because seahorses swim very slowly, which makes them vulnerable to a predator. So they've developed this structure, which you can see here. Uh, let me get that going. How does that work? Mm. Somebody will show me. I don't know. I don't need to point it out to you, but you can see in the picture the cross section of the tail. That square cross section uh, provides uh, resistance to crushing. Okay, right there. There we go. See, that's open, and then if the predator was squeezing it, it protects the spine on the inside. In addition, it has a superior ability to grip to the things that it holds onto, which is not surprising since seahorses have been gripping onto Gorgonians and sponges for millions and millions of years. But I'm not here today to talk to you about these, even though I've shared it. I have a new story. I've discovered another amusing characteristic of seahorses. The seahorse's anal fin. Now, how many of you have kept a seahorse in an aquarium? Okay. Some of you will probably have seen what I'm going to show you, but maybe you didn't think about it that much. <coughs> Let's see. Uh-oh. Hmm. There we go. So at one time, I supposed the way books that write about seahorses do, that the anal fin served a purpose like a rudder on a boat. But if you've ever kept a seahorse, you notice that the way it swims is with the dorsal fin on the back, and it uses um, the pectoral fins that are almost like ears to steer and rotate in different directions. It doesn't really use the anal fin when it's swimming. So that means that the supposition that it works like a rudder is probably not true. 
The utility of the fin becomes apparent if you keep a seahorse in an aquarium and watch it for any length of time. What it actually does is when the seahorse defecates, this fin starts spinning and then the poo starts flying and it just goes away. That's really weird. <laughs> I mean, think about it. This is not just a fin like any other fish has a little fin. This is a fin that's highly evolved. It actually has a hinge like the puffer fishes do, and it can rotate. <laughs> Very strange. So the name anal fin is especially apropos for <laughs> hippocampus. <laughs> Now, you think about this, what other creature could this remind you of? Yes, how many people have seen a hippopotamus in the zoo? Let me just say that you don't want to be behind a hippopotamus when its tail starts spinning. Proof in point, right here. Let's uh, get it going. Shimmy, shimmy, y'all, shimmy, yam, shimmy, yeah. Give me the mic so I can take her away. Off on the natural charge, bone for yard. Yeah, from the home of the dog. Okay. Now, that was a hippopotamus, but I don't have a video showing the seahorse do it, but take my word for it, they really do. Now, it's not as messy in the case of a seahorse. And the seahorse just sits there, starts wagging that anal fin. The, you can watch the poo literally just jet away. And the seahorse doesn't move. So, as I said, seahorses are slow swimmers. They spend their time being stationary. Other fish, when they defecate, their, the movement, they swim as they go. And that separates the feces, and you know, they're not bothered. Uh, so if a seahorse needed to swim to defecate, then it would be vulnerable to being eaten by a predator. So I believe that's why they've evolved this little alien fin. End of story. <laughs> Chapter two. Those of you who are reef aquarium keepers, you know what GFO is, of course. Um, but did you know that not very far away from us here in Cairns, um, there is a place in the sea where GFO is being made naturally. It's north of Sulawesi. It's a uh, volcanic island called uh, Mahangatan. And due to volcanic activity, where you have hydrothermal uh, venting and a lot of iron, as well as silicate and sulfur um, and an upflow, there are granules of GFO being deposited daily, uh, forming uh, in a natural process. And the really unusual thing about it is there are corals growing there. So if you were to visit this place, you would see fields of GFO on the bottom, like sand, and corals growing in it. Not only that, yeah, frost band made by Mother Nature, you can see it looks very familiar. Not only that, you know, we use uh, frost band in a reactor. We have upflow to keep it clean and, you know, get uniform flow. In nature where this is occurring, there is a, as I mentioned, upflow of geothermal water, hot water. And despite that, the corals thrive there. You had your chance, Anya. <laughs> um, and because of this upflow, it, it includes uh, CO2 gas, and the, the water is acidic. Um, but the upflow of CO2 gas is very uniform, and it collects in, in sort of pockets underneath the gravel or the GFO that's accumulating, and it lifts it up so it has uh, what looks like a phosphan reactor. You can see, it in, there are pictures of this in a, a paper that I read, and I'm sorry I don't have them in the, in the talk. Um, you can see the whole bottom lift up periodically and then drop down if you were to go diving there. So as the, the bubbles 
um, come through. It literally lifts the whole thing up and then they pass through and then it collapses again, almost like an aquarium ornament, but we're talking large area. Very strange. Um, so the topics I'm talking to you about today are things you probably haven't heard of and they're strange and they interest me. I think that this is the thread that connects all of these things. So chapter three, tying in with the iron of GFO, a little metal poisoning in the reef aquarium. This is a, a more serious topic. Uh, just a little forward and a little um, self-promoting, shameless look. Uh, <laughs> for several years I've been studying the effects of amino acids on, on corals and coral coloration. And one of the things that I noticed um, rather unhappily, but it, it, you know, as a scientist it interests me, uh, so I'm happy to report it, um, is that once in a while you may have the corals lose color. And uh, if, if the amino acids are promoting the color and suddenly the corals stop uh, getting colorful, um, that means something happened. Uh, you might say, well, maybe the amino acids don't work anymore or something like that, but know what I discovered, and I think this is important. Uh, Seeing the corals that are normally colorful suddenly lose their color is a sign of heavy metal poisoning. And you can reproduce this. It's very easy to demonstrate. So you're familiar with uh, Acropower, what it does with these bright fluorescent uh, colors in corals. If suddenly they brown out and otherwise your conditions are good, your calcium, your alkalinity is fine, salinity is fine, and the corals were growing and they lost color, that means it's time to look for a so source of heavy metal poisoning. So my first experience with this problem had to do with an ultraviolet sterilizer that had a wiper, and that wiper had a, a metal nut there. Let's point that. There. Right there. And it completely corroded, and then through this fitting, the metal was leaching uh, into the water passing through the reactor, or the uh, UV sterilizer. So I took that off the aquarium and the colors came back. Another experience, uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, um, an impeller that was initially coated with plastic to prevent corrosion of the metal magnet. Um, the, uh, what shall I call it? Uh, there's a, a point that the impeller, impeller connects to the pump housing. Um, it cracked and that caused the impeller to vibrate slightly inside the uh, chamber where it occurs and that peeled the plastic off the magnet and then the magnet corroded and my corals lost color. Here was another experience, a magnetic motor mount in the aquarium. As you can see, right there, the plastic housing is cracked and the epoxy potting compound inside of the housing did not protect the magnet adequately and it corroded and my corals lost color. Other examples, feeding devices, uh, this can happen so you want to look, check them periodically and that includes my own. Uh, this can happen. So if, if it does, you need to remove this from the aquarium. Fortunately, there are products on the market that you can use to remove metals from the aquarium. So last time I spoke to you, um, I discussed palithoa. And I don't want to belabor it. You know, obviously we have a limited time here. So I just wanted to touch on it once again, some key points and offer one new piece of information. So, first of all, these are palithoa, for those of you who didn't see my talk on the subject before. These are also palithoa. And they produce, and I shouldn't say they, nobody really knows who is the producer of the palitoxin, but it is associated with palithoa species. Um, it may very well be produced by microorganisms. And many of you just figure that, okay, so we know palithoa are toxic. All you have to do is 
don't let it squirt you in the eye. Um, wear standard protection gear like uh, gloves or glasses. But the truth is that's not the end of the story. There's a lot more to it because palytoxin can become aerosolized. Um, so you never want to boil a rock that has zoanthids on it or zoanthid, you know, palythoa. Um, you never really want to boil live rock, period. You never want to use a pressure washer to clean live rock or a hose or hot water in a sink. You don't want to microwave live rock or frag plugs. Believe it or not, people have done all these stupid things and they've gone to the hospital as a result, so don't do it. Uh, using a bandsaw, which is quite common for cutting up and fragging corals, you should never do that with palythoa. And there are other risks because the toxin is not just in the polyp, it's in the slime. And that was a discovery I made, and that's how I got sick. Um, and you really don't want to handle that slime uh, that comes off of palythoa. That's the one that got me a fairly ugly one, but very, very deadly. Um, here was a communication between some uh, researchers from Okinawa uh, when they had received a sample of the slime, slime that I sent them, and it was extremely, uh, or it had a, an extremely high concentration of palytoxin. They were intrigued. There are many examples you can find on the internet uh, of experiences people have had where they've been poisoned. Um, and there's publications in the uh, medical journals discussing it as well. This is a publication that came out just this month, and uh, it's a uh, researcher or researchers in Italy who, whom I met um, earlier in the summer, and one additional fact that they uh, tested was whether activated carbon used on an aquarium with uh, palythoa, whether it would re remove the palytoxin, and the answer is yes, it does. Now, their paper suggests that using activated carbon is a way to prevent uh, harm to the aquarist, and I fully disagree, and I've told the authors that. Um, I'd say that use of activated carbon is a way to prevent harm to the fish and invertebrates in the aquarium, but you still have the risk if you're handling the palythoa. So the activated carbon is really, you know, no protection for you. So I um, wanted to share that information with you. S discussing slime. See, there's a connection here. Chapter five, mystery reef slime. You know, I wrote the book, uh, Algae uh, Problem Solver Guide. And, you know, most hobbyists have trouble with green algae or slimy cyanobacteria, maybe uh, dinoflagellates or di diatoms. But there's another slime that occurs in reef aquariums. And the average hobbyist would look at it and go, mm, yeah, that's cyanobacteria. But if you put it under a microscope, you'll see that no, in fact, it's not cyanobacteria and not dinoflagellates either. Uh, there was a discussion of this by a friend of mine, Lance uh, Ichinotsubo. He's a, a hobbyist and a business owner, has a wonderful pet store in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Um, and he, in some of his maintenance accounts, he saw this white slime, which he described in Coral Magazine. You can read about it online. It's, st it's still there, available. And he also described uh, and made a suggestion that as the slime develops in the aquarium and picks up microalgae, it'll change from a whitish color to a brown, and it accumulates on the filter pads. And I think there he made a mistake, because I believe there's more than one type of organism involved in this, and one of them is absolutely brown initially. It's not that it's getting dirty. Uh, this is what it looks like. Maybe you've seen this in an aquarium. I mean, of course, there are cyanobacteria that also look like this. Uh, it'll form on the glass as well as on live rock and on the sand. And it even has bubbles in it, just like cyanobacteria, dinoflagellates, or diatoms. But if you throw it under a microscope, you don't see any cells. All you see is the slime. And here's the really interesting part. Um, in the paper or the article by Lance, he brought up the name uh, Alcaligenes, which is a genus of bacteria uh, that has uh, more recently been synonymized with the genus Cupria vitis. Um, you can write that down, look them up online, and what you'll discover is that these bacteria produce a substance 
that we're all very, very familiar with. PHA, the polymer that we use in bioplastics uh, for biodegradable, uh, marine biodegradable plastics, and we use it in biopellets in our reactors. So we have actually uh, a microorganism that lives in our aquariums that can produce this substance which we buy. <laughs> Very interesting. Little angelfish story. Many of you who have reef aquariums have pondered the thought, shall I add an angelfish to the aquarium? Is it okay to put an angelfish or even a butterfly fish in the reef aquarium? Of course it's okay. Now your corals may suffer, <laughs> but it's okay. But sometimes they don't. Haven't you noticed online these wonderful aquariums with beautiful angelfish and, and corals that are, that are hanging in there and doing all right? Well, how does that work? Is it luck? Is the hobbyist just replacing the corals? Maybe sometimes. But, you know, if you're experienced and you see one of these tanks, you know that in a case like John Coppolino's tank, that's not luck. There is a skilled aquarist, and it's working. Is it skill? I have an idea. Anybody who keeps plants or a serious gardener, you know about insects. <laughs> and maybe you've read about this, that insects induce plants to develop chemical defenses. So thinking about that, I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe corals do this too. Now, I haven't had a chance to research it, but I don't think that this has ever been published. So, something to look at, those of you in the academic community. Last story. Little story of two fish. In 1996, I was very excited uh, to see, for the first time, uh, my opportunity to buy a pair of what to you is probably less exciting, uh, Darwin Black Ocellaris Clownfish. Uh, they had not been available in, in the aquarium trade. The first ones that I ever saw were in the UK in 1995 um, in David Saxby's aquarium. And they were tank raised. And so what was special about these fish was the first time they became available to the aquarium industry, um, they were tank raised, they were not wild caught. Uh, and then, ever since that time, they've been mass-propagated. I'm sure some wild-caught ones have entered the trade, but most of the ones you see are aquaculture. Now, what, else is, what else is special about this pair of fish that I bought in 1996 is that they're still alive. So 20 years later, the marine aquarium hobby has experienced another monumental first. Many of you are aware that the uh, yellow tang, Zebrasoma, Flavescens uh, was recently reared in captivity in relatively large quantities, and that also resulted uh, basically beating the path and making uh, people who were working hard at the University of Florida to raise the blue tang, the uh, hippo, hippo tang, another hippo. Uh, they succeeded in rearing that one just a few months back. So here we are, 1996, meets 2016. I got a pair of those zebrasoma flavescens and put them together with my pair of Darwin clowns to take this picture and just mark the moment and say it's really special. Um, and it's so great to be uh, a marine aquarium hobbyist at this time uh, when wonderful things are happening uh, in our trade. So thank you. That is the talk.